All right. My watch says it is now noon, so we are going to get started. And I would like to welcome everybody and thank everybody for joining us today for our first Lunge and Learn of the season. Uh, today is, is going to be presented by our collections coordinator and research librarian, Megan Schulman. Um, she has done quite a bit of extensive research on uh, the study of corpse medicine, and she is very excited to present this to everyone. So um, if I can ask everyone to please mute yourselves or turn off your video um, in order to allow Megan to uh, give you the best experience you can. And um, I will send it over to Megan now. So Megan, take it away. Thank you, Kim. Hopefully you can hear me okay. I'm not sure. We can hear you just fine. All right, perfect. Um, okay. <laughs> so for those of you who have not seen my face before, I'm Megan Schulman, and I'm the collections coordinator and research librarian here for the Lancaster Medical Heritage Museum. And I'm here to talk to you guys today about corpse medicine. Um, and a lot of you may be wondering, how on earth did you pick this topic to do? And the answer is, I have no real clue. <laughs> uh, one day I was researching smallpox and the next corpse mes medicine. So let's get started. Um, of course, oops, before we can actually get started, um, I wanted to put out a brief disclaimer out there for the audience. This is not an upbeat topic and I'm in no way an expert on the matter, um, but I'm gonna do my best to portray this topic in a, a safe, respectable manner. Um, there are some things that I'm going to address uh, a little later that touch on this, and I want to note that I will not be covering any religious or indigenous examples in this lecture because um, that requires a lot of precision and research that I could not complete currently. So the topics I'm going to cover today are as follows. Um, the first one is going to be, was this even real? <laughs> this is a new topic for a lot of people, so I'm going to try out to lay out some definitions and a stable foundation for the remainder of the presentation. Um, the next one will be, how is this even allowed? You guys will now know that this is a real and trusted practice, but how is this even allowed and what did this mean for society as we knew it? Why was this occurring? We know that um, it was used widespread, but was everyone okay with it? Were there anti-corpse medicine movements or anything similar to that? And who did this practice happen to? Uh, we'll close this out with a connection to the present day and I'll pose a question for you now to think about um, do you think that this is still happening or is it kind of just to the waywards um, a quick spoiler alert if you are not aware humans have been using corpse medicine for a lot longer than we originally thought going back in time to Galen and Hippocrates um, Galen who was a well-known second century physician he discusses the curative effect of the elixir of burned human bones um, and they had on that they had on epilepsy and arthritis. And in the case of Hippocrates, his text prescribed something that was called pollutant therapy. Um, this was the use of bodily pollutants, such as the blood of violence or menstrual blood, and quote, corpse food, uh, used to fight impurity and disease. This, so um, this could be any bodily product outside of what we consider natural humors. Um, but by far, the most well-known examples are a few that follows. Um, and I'm going to ask you to bear with me for the pronunciation of some of these names because I'm terrible at that. So we have the first one, which is Roman gladiators, um, Avancina or Ibn Sina, Marsilio Ficino, and St. Albertus Magnus. And I'm going to go into detail about these. So first, the ancient Romans used to believe that gladiator blood drunk hot from a gladiator's wounds would cure epilepsy or imbue the drinker with their strength. And if you ask people about corpse medicine, this is usually one of the first things they will say um, that it's like a very well-known example of what to use when you talk about corpse medicine is the gladiators. Another well-known historical example is Avancina, who, um, was alive from 980 to 1037 and was one of the first Arabian advocates for this practice. Avancina promoted um, mummia rather than hot blood, but was said it would and said it was useful in the cases of abscesses, eruptions, fractures, concussions, paralysis, hemocrania, epilepsy, vertigo, spitting of blood from the lung, affections of the throat, 
heart, debility of the stomach, disorders of the liver, and as an antidote for poison. So it really, the list just goes on and on for things that this was used for. And this was usually not taken straight. Um, they weren't forcing people to just swallow powder. It was mixed with some herb or in some convenient vehicle, as they describe it, which was wine, milk, butter, oil. Um, and at the time of his death, Arabian authorities were advocating for using any part of the mummy, just not, not just what was considered mummia, which will be discussed shortly. Marsilio Ficino, who was a 15th century Italian scholar and priest, um, his father was a physician, had this to say about the elderly. He said, quote, um, why shouldn't old people likewise suck the blood of the youth, um, a youth, I say, who is willing, healthy, and temperate, whose blood is of the best, of the best, but perhaps too abundant. Uh, they will suck, therefore, like leeches, an ounce or two from a scarcely open vein of the left arm. If they have difficulty digesting raw blood, don't worry. Um, they say, uh, let it first be cooked together with sugar or let it be mixed with sugar and then moderately distilled over hot water and then drunk. So human blood tea, essentially. St. Albertus Magnus, who was um, 1559, uh, talked about, quote, distilling the blood of a healthy man as if it were rose water. And the result from this was said to cure any disease of the body. So corpse medicine or medical cannibalism or mummia or co corpse pharmacology, or there's a whole slew of other names that were attached to using human remains or human body parts as a treatment for other humans. Uh, but first I want to define and acknowledge the definition of cannibalism because that's usually what we talk about uh, first when it comes to medical cannibalism and corpse medicine, they're kind of used interchangeably. Um, so this is the definition of cannibalism. It's straightforward. It's the eating of human flesh by other human beings. And as you can see, this really wasn't completely defined until the late 1700s, um, which was long after the practice started and took place. However, the word itself has a much more tangled definition. Uh, for those of you who do not know, this is the etymological definition of the word cannibal. Um, etymology just means basically the history of where the word itself derives from. And in this instance, the word cannibal has the possibility of deriving from the word that was used for the peoples of the Caribbean. Um, it was used as a way, um, new world cannibalism, as they called it, uh, was also employed as a way to dehumanize the native inhabitants and justify slavery. And because of this, I will be using other words in place of medical cannibalism, like corpse medicine or, um, this word, which again, I'm gonna ask you to <laughs> bear with me on my pronunciation. One of the words that could replace this is anthropophagy, um, which is the literal translation of flesh or man eater. Um, this is the word that would be used in anthropology today and is pretty standard. And it's important to note for many reasons. Um, one of them being that this new phrase, medical anthropogenism, it encompasses what people throughout history were actually using body parts for. Uh, it, in reality, it was not just the bodies of the deceased that were being used, although that occurred at a much higher rate, but the living were used as well. So this kind of creates that umbrella term for this to fall under. Um, Louise Noble, who was the author of Medical Cannibalism in Early Modern English Literature, stated that this practice quote, was never just about eating, um, but it rather serves as a foundation for the cultural order, which I think is important to note that this wasn't just a medical practice, it was a cultural thing as well. It created a so-called so -called cultural fascination bordering on near obsession with the medical recycling of corpse matter. Um, as a result, we see that the human body becomes a commodity in this time. Um, it's important to note that this is not the first time that society has viewed the human body as a, as a commodity, because that would mean ignoring the entirety of the slave trade, but it was this cultural shift that society can now get something from their people even after their death and without their consent that caused this, this obsession. So this begs the question, how was this even allowed? Um, but let me say that this was not only allowed, it was endorsed and regularly used by kings and royalty, at least in England. Um, English physicians regularly administered mummy as a drug to King Henry VIII. And of course there is king, the king's drops uh, for Charles II. 
Apparently, the king paid 6,000 pounds to Godard, who was a member of the Royal Society, and he received recognition for his distilled powdered skull recipe. Um, I'm not sure what kind of recognition he received on this matter, but regardless, Charles II began to create variants in his laboratory. Uh, he would mix these the powdered skull with alcohol, which he would frequently drink. Um, the drops were often mixed into wine or chocolate and became popular for a variety of elements. Uh, the skulls acquired for the use in these king drops came from Ireland after paying grave diggers to supply them and not charging them, um, which we will talk about later. So at, they say that at the time of his death, they were giving him like 40 drops at a time. And researchers are not sure whether or not Charles II taking those drops actually sped up his death or prevented it from anything. So you see, this was really never supposed to happen. And sadly, it is just one simple misunderstanding after another. What the ancient Egyptians used um, as mummia was mummia with a Y. And it was also called bitumen, which is a black asphalt-like substance. It's actually the liquid binding agent of asphalt. And it was thought at this time to alleviate elements such as diverse as epilepsy, gout, and even the plague. Mummia, from which our word mummy is derived from, is Persian in origin, and it primarily meant wax, but it was also used to denote the natural bitumen. Um, I mean, it really came from the belief that the bitumen was used in the preparation of these mummies. So it dropped a letter, and then the term became applicable to not only the material, but to the bodies themselves. And this became made from any corpse that they could get their hands on. It wasn't just Egyptian mummies at a later point. Was this an honest mistake? I'm not sure. <laughs> but it definitely opened the door for a broader understanding of the human body. This practice relied on the central tenet that the human body contains this mysterious healing power that was transmitted by ingesting human remains in the sense of like calls to like. So the question was not, should you eat humans as we would expect, but rather what part of the human should you eat? And there were a lot. So the most common commodities were blood, bone, human fat, cadavers, skulls, and other excrements. So really just the entire body, they found a way to use it and apply it to, to anything. Um, by the 1650s, there was a general belief that drinking fresh hot blood, like mentioned with the gladiators, um, from the recently deceased would cure epilepsy as well as help with consumption. Meanwhile, dried and powdered blood was recommended for nosebleeds or sprinkled on wounds to stop bleeding. Blood was the noblest of the humors and was also called the elixir vital or the elixir of life. And these pictures are both from the same product of Clark's world famed blood mixture, which was deemed the great blood purifier and restorer. Um, it's actually small on the ad, the written ad, but it says it cures old sores, ulcerated sore legs, scurvy sores, glandular swelling, blackheads, pimples on the face, blood, um, and skin diseases, ulcerated sores on the neck. Um, and also it clears the blood from any impure matter and cures you from whatever cause is also arising. And at the top, we can see that quote that takes us back to that elixir of life motif, which just says, quote, for the blood is the life. With this came blood jam. And I wish I was joking, but I am not. This is the recipe for blood jam from a French apothecary. So first you had to place the blood upon a flat, smooth table of soft wood. Then you were to cut it up into thin little slices, allowing its watery part to drip away. When it was no longer dripping, you would place it on the stove on the same wooden table and stir it into a batter with a knife. When that is absolutely dry, you would place it immediately in a very warm bronze mortar and pound it, which then you would force through a sieve of the finest silk. And then when that has been sieved, you were to seal it in a glass jar and renew it in the spring of every year. So this was a repeatedly occurring event in these people's uh, daily daily lives. So now we go on to 
bones. Uh, bones were used to treat catarrh, um, again, with my pronunciation, which is a buildup of mucus in the airway or cavity of the body. It usually affects the back of the nose, the throat, or the sinuses, flux of the menses, which is just a regular menstrual cycle, and dysentery, which is the infection of the intestines and diarrhea. And this would just be ground up and used like the king's drops were, where it was mixed into wine or chocolate and ingested. So now we get to mummy or mummia. Uh, we can see an advertisement um, suggested ways for this matter to be extracted. And I zoomed in here so you can see it a little bit better. So it talks about the differences of mummies and the extraction of it again. And mummy had many purposes as did most medication at this time. So at first it was crumbled into tinctures to stanch internal bleeding, which is pretty normal because any powder helps like coagulation. Um, but then it became a painkiller, which was said to be effectual in purging the head against the pains of the spleen. It was used as a cough suppressant, as an anti-inflammatory and a menstrual aid. Again, just um, used for a lot of things. Unfortunately, this was not the only um, effects people could have gotten from this powder. Recent studies have found that mummy powder could have caused death. Um, but not in what the way you're probably thinking. Um, researchers found that certain microorganisms involved in the transmission of the plague can survive on the same corpses that were being used for mummia. Uh, between 1720 and 1722, France experienced several outbreaks of the plague, the largest of which occurred in Marseille, um, which was a major mummy making center. Um, and I will leave you to decide whether or not that was a coincidence, but research is pointing to the fact that ingesting uh, or creating these mummies and bringing them there actually helped spread the plague, which is a side effect that not a lot of people consider. Um, human fat was also used and it was rubbed onto the skin to ease gout and injected for bleeding and bruising. It was used for cancers, for love potions, rheumatism, or even used as a plaster. And it was, quote, often sold and applied by public executioners. Um, and it was used extensively on wounds and sores and remained popular as part as an ointment until the Georgian era, which was from 1714 to 1830, which is before the start of the American Revolution to a few decades before the Civil War. Um, not only was that it was used for that, but it was also used to mollify the hardness of um, catraces, which is the scar of a healed wound. And especially with those smallpox scars that everyone was getting at this time, it was it was kind of used for everything that needed surface level healing attention, like burns and such. Um, and when I say that the physicians at this time found a way to use every part of the body, I. I do mean it. A doctor at this time named Dr. James also recommended cadaver skin for difficult labors and hysteric affections or menses. I'm not quite sure what they hoped this would achieve. Nevertheless, they did it anyways. Um, this was definitely not a popular treatment. They would take the skin of a cadaver and place it over um, the affected area and hope that it would fix everything. Um, but they instead switched to um, using the skins of animals later. Um, it also did not help. But other recipes for cadavers included choosing the carcass of a man who was whole, clear, without blemish, or aged 24 years that hath been hanged, broke upon a wheel, or thrust through. The flesh should then be chopped to bits, sprinkled with herbs like myrrh and aloe, and mashed in wine. Afterwards, it was dry, it would be cured in a shady spot where it would become comparable to spoiled meat without the stink. Essentially, they were making human jerky, um, which I will leave you with that image. All right, moving on to skulls. Skulls, so this is actually broken up into two parts with the first just being the straight skull. Um, it, it was suggested that the vital force of the human body became concentrated in the skulls of individuals who had died of violent and premature deaths. And this is why John French, who was a 17th century physician, had multiple recipes for distilling skulls into spirits that, quote, helps the falling sickness, gout, dropsy, and he kind of deemed it this kind of panacea. 
The other recipes he had were better for epilepsy um, and convulsions, all fevers and passions of the heart. So it really was a cure-all, which again was pretty common for medicine at this time. The second kind of skull is skull moss, also ca called eucenia, also known as beard lichen, um, which is in medicine called mucus ex cranio humano. Um, it was basically known as this moss that could survive on anything. And it became a prized additive whose powder was believed to cure nosebleeds and epilepsy. Um, numerous surgeons and physicians would press or sprinkle powdered moss of the skull into a bleeding wound. And again, powder induces coagulation. So this was always sort of going to work, but one physician describes how, quote, various gentle patients with nosebleeds thrust powdered skull moss up their nostrils. Um, not only that, but it would also treat whooping cough and manage epilepsy. So <laughs> um, again, it was just taking the skull with the moss this time and grinding it into a powder and using it like that. Not even the insides of skulls were spared, according to physicians. Um, if you thought blood jam was bad, get ready for the essence of man's brains from the art of distillation from 1651 with John French again. You were to take the brains of a young man that has died a violent death, and together with the membranes, arteries, veins, and nerves, you were to bruise these in a stone mortar until they became a kind of pap. I'm assuming it's like, like a jelly consistency. And then you put as much of the spirit of wine as will cover it, and then ingest it like that. He did not say what that would cure, um, but it could probably be an ailment of the head because that's what um, treatments like that would be. Here is one that will make you very thankful to live in modern times. Guess what Robert Boyle's treatment for cataracts was? Yes, human excrement. He recommended drying it into a powder, then grinding it up and blowing it into the eye and it would supposedly clear that cataract right up. I don't think this worked, but enough people did it that it was worth mentioning. So why was this occurring? People were more than okay with this. Unlike vaccination, and there were some overlap between the two practices, um, medical anthropology did not have any anti-eating corpses movements like Victorian England did with the smallpox vaccine. This does not mean that everyone was okay with it by any means, uh, but it was spared the very public and extreme backlash that the vaccination mo movement did. My guess as to why was that it was, it was not mandatory. So people were like, if others wanna take this treatment, then let them. Um, the only resistance that physicians actively voiced in their writings, especially as you get closer to modern times, was the legitimacy of mummies um, that they were using to sell mummia. It wasn't all against it. It was just make sure that they're real Egyptian mummies and everything will be okay. But everything else was kind of spared until we get into more understanding of germ theory and everything like that. So this leads us to whose bodies were even being used for this widespread and generally accepted treatment. The first group of people that I'm going to discuss are the bodies of criminals. And this is not the first time that criminal bodies were being used outside of medicine. In fact, the processing, consuming, and treating of human bodies as medical drugs was made possible by a judicial system that systematically executed large numbers of its citizens and assumed state ownership of the bodies that were then made available for their quote scientific dissection in public anatomy theaters and that's what the this picture has right here is this criminal coming off the gallows um, then being dissected to learn more about human anatomy committing a crime at this time basically meant that you forfeited your rights to your body after death this opened the door for something called reparative justice, or rather reparations, as we've probably all heard today. Um, in this case scenario, it meant dissection enabled criminals to make amends for their crimes by contributing with their bodies to the health of the state. Now, while it may seem like they purposefully executed criminals for access to their bodies, um, there's very little evidence to, 
confirm that. However, that's not to say that these people didn't enjoy the convenient benefits that this system provided. And it was not just their corpses that were being used. It was also at the execution site. Uh, Edward Brown, who was alive in Vienna in the winter of 1668, said he witnessed after one beheading, um, he watched as a man run speedily with a pot in his hand and filling it with the blood yet still sprouting out of the corpse. And this was common. People would go with metal cups to get a, a drop of blood from these people because they really thought that it would just cure everything. So was there any pushback? Were people upset at disrespecting criminals in this manner? The answer is no. Um, however, it did raise some moral issues about risk. Now, I know what you're probably thinking. Finally, the risk of bloodborne diseases, these people are, are taking notice, but this was not the case. Instead, the, the risk was the fear of infecting the drinker with the disease of criminality. Um, it's just enough said with that. Um, this was still not enough to discourage those from participating in this practice. And as a result, these acts were frequently a part of the execution site itself, um, as mentioned in the previous slide and how executioners would willingly get the human fat and um, disseminate it to the people. Of course, the next group we will talk about is mummies, both legitimate and non-legitimate because there were both. Um, I bet you did not know that the initial interest in mummies from the Europeans was medicinal. European demand for mummy grew significantly in the 15th century when merchants began plundering Egyptian tombs and bringing the results back to apothecaries in Europe. Tombs in Cairo were raided and the corpses were boiled to retrieve the oily substance floating at the top, which was the bitumen. Um, mummy heads were sold for gold, and there was even a mummy import tax in England because they were so popular. So what did people do when the mummies started running out or they became too expensive? They went to the black market. And yes, there, were a black, there was a black market then, and in this case, it was the sale of counterfeits. Um, they began showing up in the form of other bodies, such as beggars, lepers, and plague victims. Their corpses were then scavenged and stuffed with aloe, myrrh, bitumen, and then baked and dried in a furnace and then dipped in pitch. They were really trying to just emulate the Egyptian mummy uh, as quickly as possible to get their profit. Um, and that's how we got these fake counterfeit mummies. This, of course, leads us to our next and last category, which is the anonymous or those who died spontaneously or even political enemies. After the craze with mummies were over both real and fake, uh, people generally turned to what would be the next be best thing. And in this case, unfortunately, it would be the youths who had died from a sudden and violent death because of the belief that if the person was deceased for too long, the soul would be unable to aid in the healing process. Or anonymous people who's, anyone who people wouldn't notice are missing, or anyone that had died and had no one to mourn for them or collect their body was subject to becoming part of this medical commodity trade. And we cannot forget that political enemies were also in play. I mentioned this briefly when I talked about Charles II and his king drops, but another group of people that corpses were obtained from were political enemies. During the 17th century, the English imported Irish skulls, quote, plucked, they say plucked a lot, <laughs> um, from these battlefields that were sold in pharmacies in Germany and across the United Kingdom. For the English, the Irish were seen as deeply inferior, and it was just another way to show their inferiority, um, which is the same thing that they were doing with these new world cannibals, as they call them also. And now the question that I asked at the beginning of this lecture, is this still happening? The answer, yes, it is. Um, and it's called auto cannibalism. And you can and probably have cannibalized yourself, but not how you're thinking. Fingernail biting, eating hair or picking skin or even picking your nose and eating it, which is called muc mucophagy, are all forms of this auto artist auto sarcophagy. Don't mind me. Um, we all did it as kids, but again, here's that suffix 
suffix again of phagy, the P-H-A-G-Y, which means ingestion or devouring. And today, when people think about using the body as medicine, um, in today's society, I personally think of placentophagy, which is the postpartum ingestion of placenta. I believe some people get them freeze-dried and crushed into pills, but I know there's um, other modes of ingestion. But what you may not know is that this practice is very common amongst other mammals aside from human. Um, and you can see that phagy suffix again, which again is ingestion. So it's just broken down into the same as anthrophagy, but instead of people, it's placentas. Blood transfusions. Here is an example of using others' bodies as a way to help others. Um, but this is not without consequences. The blood bank has been transformed from a source of communalized health with its ability to help those in need um, with community involvement. However, it should be noted that similar to how people were fearful of the disease of criminality, the blood banks and blood transfusions became a fear of communalized risk. Another modern day example of how we use other people's bodies is with organ transplants, both living or dead. Um, 105,800 people are on the waiting list for organs currently, uh, with kidneys being the most needed. Uh, this is another reason why I personally believe that we need to move away from the term corpse medicine and turn to more medical anthropology. Uh, because it allows us to talk about and include things like kidney donations and blood transfusions, which can be done with a live donor. One example that is often forgot are skin grafts, which is another part of your body that you can donate after death. These are typically used to treat burn victims and for compound fractures where the bone breaks through the skin or other large wounds. And of course, we cannot talk about today's medical pharmacology without circling back to the black market, or rather the red market organ trade. This is a new phrase that specifically focuses on the trade of organs and such instead of weapons. It was coined by a recent book. Um, I can't remember the author's name off the top of my head. Um, I will note that Iran is currently the only country that you are allowed to buy and sell organs legally. Uh, everywhere else, it is illegal and has to be donated through the proper channels. Sometimes it's easier to think of such things as being left in the past, but a quick Google search today can tell you that the red market is alive and thriving. And the cause of it is poverty. Yes, people in poverty and even homeless people are being paid to illegally donate their organs. Unfortunately, countries where this is an issue are having difficulty prosecuting because of medical privacy laws. Currently, the World Health Organization estimates that there is an illegal kidney dealing every hour, with this happening mostly in China and other um, Eastern Asian countries. And the statistics are pretty jarring. Officially, the United States does more legal organ transplants than any other nation in the world, with more than 40,000 in the last year. Unofficially, the world leader is by far is China, and experts believe that almost none of the organs were donated but were stolen from political prisoners who were either executed or alive when their organs were harvested, which really brings us full circle to how the demand for bodies created this illicit trade, um, similar to how that demand for Egyptian mummies, uh, mummies created that illicit trade with them also. But so what? We as humans have this weird thing about medical procedures, fears, wishes, and we're willing to do nearly anything in the name of attaining that fountain of youth or elixir of life. While corpse medicine may seem like quackery, it's important to note that quackery isn't always about pure deception and all scientific research has started somewhere. Humans are willing to ingest cadavers, all in the name of survival and resilience. And while we may not ingest corpses, cook brains, and drink blood straight from the gladiators or youth, today it's commonplace and quite acceptable to use other people's body parts for medicinal reasons, some of which I mentioned previously. Blood transfusions, skin grafts, and organ donation are miracles to people who have found themselves on this internal waiting list. Uh, scientific research now shows us that we are getting smaller and smaller in our focus while using other people's bodies, stem cells, bone marrow, donation of eggs and sperm. We, we use other people's bodies for surrogacy and it, it gives hope and to so many people, but we're still very hesitant at the idea of breast milk banks. We are a society of contradictions but also one of great resilience. 
all of this to say back then they really took you are what you eat to a whole different level thank you and if you have any questions feel free to ask and here are my sources and thanks again for coming Megan, that was fantastic. Thank you so much for all the research that you did and all the work that you put into this. Um, I learned a lot and I think you did a fantastic job. Um, we do have a few questions. Um, I can you, you can hear me, correct? Yes. Okay, so um, one question was, and if anybody else has any other questions, please feel free to put them in the chat um, and we'll answer as many as we can get to. Um, but one of the questions was when you were speaking about blood, um, were there people who sold their blood periodically for the purpose, uh, specifically um, in the old, older times? I do, we know people donate. Now. Yeah, I didn't come across with people actually selling their blood. It was more of a donation basis, if I can say that. Um, otherwise, it was from violent deaths uh, at the execution site or at the gladiators arena um or in the case of the 15th century marcio Ficino, i believe he said that he would kindly ask a person of good temperament to open their vein for them so i don't think it was anything that had to do with monetary purpose currently because we don't see people selling their bodies for medicine at this time um but it was more of a donation or a criminal sort of enterprise and speaking of criminals is there a reason that they chose somebody who would have died of a violent death so it criminals is for the purpose that they were basically serving a purpose outside they were helping the people that they hurt essentially um but also for the violent death they believed that if you um were younger the younger you are when you died the more healing power your body had because you didn't have time to heal yourself. So you have all this unspent healing energy in your body that you could then harvest by getting someone who I think was run through um, or uh, broken upon the wheel, essentially. Awesome, thank you. Um, any other questions for Megan? Um, I'll give it a second here and do my uh, thank you. So again, thank you to Megan, um, who did a lot of research and a lot of her own personal time to put this together. And I want to thank all of you who took the time out of your day to come and see this. Um, we do not have a lunch and learn scheduled for March at the moment. Um, if you are interested in doing a lunch and learn or a lecture like this, please feel free to contact me at director at lancastermedicalheritagemuseum.org. Um, I'm always open to new ideas and new lectures. Um, they are typically held on the first Tuesday of the month now because of the museum being open. Um, so again, thank you all. It doesn't look like we have any questions. So Megan, again, thank you. And I hope to see everybody again. So have a great rest of your day.